everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I am Beth Mischewski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. Um, the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. I'll remind our audience members here to please silence electronic devices as we're recording today's webinar. We will be holding all questions until the end, at which time I'll bring around this microphone so that everyone online can hear your questions. Everyone online, you will remain muted for the entire webinar, but you can type in your questions at any time through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll get to those at the end as well. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Carla Ng. Carla is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. She has a secondary appointment in environmental and occupational health in the Graduate School of Public Health. She earned her PhD in chemical and biological engineering from Northwestern University. Her research group at the University of Pittsburgh generally focuses on the development of models for the fate of chemicals in organisms and ecosystems, working at the intersection of chemistry, biology, and engineering. In particular, her research focuses on the development of mechanistic toxicokinetic models of PFAS in organisms and using protein PFAS interactions to understand and predict their impacts across different PFAS structures and species of interest. She was recently awarded the NSF Career Award to support her work on PFAS. So Carla, thanks for joining us. The webinar is yours. All right, thanks so much, Beth, and um, thanks for the invite. This is my first webinar, so we're going to see how it goes. Um, and since I can't see any of you and I can't ask you all to raise your hands to let me know how much you know about PFAS, I hope you don't mind if I take you through a little bit of a PFAS primer at the beginning, uh, just for those that might be less familiar with the chemicals. Um, but I'd like to start out right off the bat, before I forget, uh, acknowledging the folks who make all this happen. This is my research group. Um, and we don't do things other than PFAS, so we have students that work in green infrastructure and work on food systems and work on PAH degradation. But today I'm really going to focus on the PFAS work that we do. Um, and I'm mostly going to work uh, focus on the work that's uh, been done by two of my early PhD students, Wei Xiao Chang and Manisha Kazi. Um, Hajar is a new student to the group. She just started, so hopefully she'll be picking up in the future work part that you'll hear a little bit about um, as we get towards the end. So for those of you that are less aware of PFAS, I kind of wanted to give a, a little bit of a broad overview. Um, if you know about NHANES, this is this national study of um, the health of the US population, basically, that's, that's undertaken by the CDC. And they come up with um, environmental contaminant levels in human blood every few years. They update their data. And since 1999, they've been um, looking for and finding PFAS. And uh, at, and at least four of them that were originally sought uh, for PFOS, PFOA, PFHXS, and PFNA have been found in the serum of nearly everyone tested nationwide. And so basically, um, these chemicals um, undergo widespread human and wildlife exposure. And as we look for more and more different types of PFAS, we find them. And so there are many of these that are bioavailable and enter um, human bodies. So we, of course, would like to know about um, what the impacts of that widespread exposure are. Um, and for those who are less familiar, PFAS refers to the whole class of per and polychloroalkyl substances. And then this is one of those um, areas of research where you just have acronym soup everywhere and you have to kind of get used to it. So acronyms within the class of PFAS, like PFOS, PFOA, PFHXS, PFNA, all refer to different structures. So in general, for example, if you see something that ends in an S, usually that means it's a, it's a sulfonic acid. If it ends in an A, it's a carboxylic acid. And then the stuff in between tells you how long the chain length is. So in this case, HX is for six, N is for nine. And these structural features are important because they really influence the distribution um, of PFAS in the environment, how they're distributed within organisms, their potential toxic impacts, and their biological half-lives, which are all things that um, are of great interest in understanding their, their impact. And the way that we first got to know about them was through these two first substances that were detected to be widespread. Uh, PFOA and PFOS, and they were most known as the non-stick chemicals. So they came from things like Teflon, Scotchgard, Gore-Tex, and one of the most now well-studied routes of environmental release of these chemicals are, of course, this 
so-called AFFF, aqueous film forming foams, which are PFAS containing firefighting foams that are uh, especially good at putting out fuel fires because they make a very nice smothering blanket over the flames. And one of the unfortunate practices that was in place for a long time is that PFAS containing AFFF was used not just to fight the fires, but also in fire training exercises. And here's just a couple of images that show you um, um, how this occurred. And so the, these are um, Navy officers who are testing um, the equipment to make sure that it's spraying the foam adequately. So this is just a test case in which they were using the real foam. Here is another, a bit more dramatic um, representation of that. So this is, um, I think, looking within a, a hangar structure uh, at an Air Force base and making sure that if there was a fire inside the structure, they would be able to smother it. Um, and unfortunately, this was not an uncommon occurrence. So in, in this case, they're basically filling up the hangar with foam and then they will spray it out uh, and basically dilute it with water and wash it away. And so uh, the use of AFFF really led to a lot of groundwater contamination by these chemicals. And that was behind many of the first detections of PFAS in groundwater and in drinking water. And so this is a map that was put together by the Environmental Working Group. Uh, this is a fairly recent one. And so it just shows areas in the United States in which PFAS has been found either in, on military sites, in drinking water, or other known sites of contamination. Uh, and one thing that I always like to point out here, let me see if my mouse works. Uh, if you look over here at Michigan, you might think, wow, what did Michigan do? Well, what, <laughs> what Michigan did is it actually went out and looked. Uh, and so the high density of points that you see here is not due to the fact that they have a, a particularly bad case of PFAS exposure, but that they've done the most monitoring to find those sites. And you can see also uh, here in New Jersey, there's quite a density of points. And so what we might expect is there will be higher density of points everywhere where we look closer. And uh, also because uh, AFFF is not the only source of PFAS, it's only the one that's probably the best characterized so far. And so there are many other sources of PFAS that are much less well characterized. So we know that they are in a lot of food contact materials. Um, and this is a known human exposure route. There are some recent papers that have come out talking about people who eat more uh, and, and restaurants, more takeout food are more highly exposed. Um, they are used basically anywhere where you want to keep a grease stain from being transferred across uh, some materials. So pizza boxes, um, burger wrappers, popcorn bags, um, these bags that hold cookies. Um, they're also used in a lot of household materials and um, uh, indoor use materials. So floor waxes are known sources, carpets are known sources. There's some good news in the carpet arena in this, uh, the sense that both Home Depot and Lois have now said they're going to be banning PFAS containing carpets, uh, carpets from their stores, which is good news for that road of exposure. There are a lot of makeup products, uh, personal care products that use PFAS. Um, so if you think about things that are meant to glide smoothly over your skin, um, often they will have a Teflon component or some other uh, fluoropolymer or floral ether component. Things like um, dental floss, uh, you know, it glides smoothly between your teeth because there's, there's Teflon in there. Um, shaving cream and a, a, probably one of the least well-known sources is fluorinated drugs, um, and there is some discussion about whether those should count as PFAS or not, depending on um, how much of the molecule is fluorinated and, and what it lends to the properties of the molecule. So we go back to this map that was mostly mapping out drinking water contamination and, and contamination associated either with airports or military sites where this foam was used, but in fact we know that there are many more different PFAS used in many products um, with direct exposure to humans, and that characterization is still underway, and there's still a lot of work to be done there. So uh, if you're thinking about these routes of exposure, we know that if you live near a contaminated site, if you live near a military base, near an airport, drinking water is usually the major exposure route. Uh, if you don't have drinking water contamination, usually food is the, the major source of um, PFAS intake. And there's still research on going to better understand how these indoor exposures, so cleaning products, personal care products, carpets, um, and air um, also contribute to human exposure. So how did we get here? I think I've given a lot of talks around PFAS, and when you kind of step back to look at the enormity of the problem now, the fact that there are so many contaminated sites that we are finding many of the substances have toxic effects, and they're extremely persistent, and so they're going to be very difficult to treat. Um, a lot of us like to stop and ask ourselves, how did this happen? How, was, how, how did we get where we are today? So one of the issues with PFAS is that the approaches that we have in place to catch what we think of as 
problematic chemicals. Your, your traditional persistent biocumulative and toxic substances don't really work for PFAS. PFAS don't behave like a traditional POP. They don't really behave like PCBs or DDT. In, uh, and before PFAS came to everybody's attention, the regulatory methods that were put into place to predict, for example, bioaccumulation potential relied largely on partitioning processes. So um, if you're not a chemical hazard assessor, you're not really used to thinking about things this way, partitioning models are what I like to think of as bag of lipid models. So if you're modeling, uh, for example, PCBs in fish, you can model your fish as a bag of lipid uh, and that works pretty well. You'll know more or less how much PCBs will stay in the water and how much will go into your fish. But this so-called bag of lipid model really doesn't work for PFAS. So unlike traditional POPs, PFAS don't partition, they distribute. A lot of their um, fate and activity within biological systems uh, is driven by protein and phospholipid interactions. And so a particular distribution of proteins that can vary by species, by sex, um, by age, can really change where these chemicals go and how long they stay there. So this leads to very unique and very variable tissue distributions, biological half-lives, and toxic effects. And so in my research group, we've really been focused on trying to understand how PFAS interactions with proteins, membrane transporters, and other what we call key biomolecules help us to understand whole organism fate of these critical substances. And so um, for today's talk, I'm really going to focus on three areas, um, toxicokinetics, toxicodynamics, and treatment. So I like to think of these in layman's terms as where do PFAS go? Uh, oops, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> where do they go? What do they do once they get there? And then what can we do about it? Um, and I will say that, you know, as I, long as I've been working in this area, probably the toxicokinetic component is the, the best developed part. So this we've done a lot of work in. This is kind of where we are doing our work now and trying to understand this part a bit better, and this is where we're headed. We really want to take this knowledge that we're creating by these chemicals and figure out how can we be proactive and do something about them. So in a, another way to think about this is the toxicokinetics component is used to describe the PFAS. Uh, what we're doing with tox toxicity right now is, is a way to screen or predict which ones might be problematic, and then the treatment part is how can we act uh, given that knowledge. So we'll start with toxicokinetics. Um, so basically these are models to figure out where the chemicals go, where they distribute within an organism, and how long they stay, whether they accumulate or not. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the PFAS protein interactions can affect their internal distribution, so the tissues in which they accumulate, and they also lead to these really interesting, unique, and variable elimination kinetics. So for those of you um, who may have seen some of these data, this is extracted from a very nice review uh, that just came out this year. Um, and basically looks across different chain lengths of PFAS, so four carbon carboxylate, four carbon sulfonate, six carbon sulfonate, and then the two very well-known PFO and PFOS. And we're looking at their uh, elimination half-lives in serum for a number of different organisms. So we have humans at the top here, female monkeys, male monkeys, female rats, male rats, female mice, and male mice. And please note that the y-axis is on the log scale, and this is the uh, half-life in days. So that we can see for single chemicals, so let's look here at PFOA, um, that the half-life in the female rat is on the order of uh, less than a day, so on the order of hours. On the male rat, it's on the order of days, right? Um, and in humans, it's on the order of years. So we have across species and even within a species across sexes, really, really different behavior. Uh, and you may think, well, the humans, you know, they're not all that variable. They're all up here and they don't look that different. But in fact, one, this is a big step from 1,000 um, to 10,000. And two, these data were not um, separated by sex. So when you look more closely at the variability in the human population, you see that there is this wide variability, um, especially if you look at something like PFHXS. This is a six carbon um, perfluorinated uh, hexane sulfonate. And this is the half-life in years in humans. Uh, and you can see that it, it's, it has a median of around six years, but it goes down to almost two and up to nearly 10. So depending on the population, it can be really, really variable. And so there's a need to understand this so that we can better understand risks posed by these substances. So one of the things that we've been working on in my group for some time is to develop toxicokinetic models to understand within a single organism, what are the protein interactions that really drive how long uh, the serum half-life is and in which tissues something will accumulate. 
And so Wei Xiao Cheng here was one of my first PhD students, and he put together uh, sort of what we call a best case model. So we, we wanted to find the organism and the PFAS for which the most data was available so we could see if we could really make a model from the ground up. And so we chose to do a PFOA model for the rat um, to try and gain a little bit of insight into which of these interactions are most important. So what do we need to know to put a model like this together? We need to really understand the intra and extracellular environment and how PFAS interacts uh, with those environments in different tissues. So we need to know uh, whether it enters cells through passive diffusion, at what rate that happens, if there are membrane transporter interactions, which we know are important in places like the kidney. Um, what are the interactions within the cellular environment? Are they binding to proteins in the cell and therefore accumulating there? And what are the interactions in the extracellular environment? And that includes in the blood serum. So what's leading to these high half-lives in blood? And so the bottom-up PBDK model, which is what we like to call it, that he put together has 72 independent parameters, and those parameters describe the physiology of the rat, binding of PFAS to different proteins, and transport across cell membranes. Um, so for example, we looked at binding to albumin outside the cells and binding to proteins like LFADP, liver fatty acid binding protein, and alpha-2 globulin within the cells, and then transporter activity and passive diffusion um, as they go into and out of different tissues. And we evaluated the model against seven different data sets from three studies. Um, so these were for both high and low doses of PFOA. The highest was one milligram per kilogram. The lowest was 0 0.041 milligram per kilogram. And we looked both at oral and IV dosing and uh, tried to predict the plasma time course and the tissue distribution. And so just to show you how that worked, uh, this is a paper that was published in 2017. Um, and so the um, Symbols that you see here in red and blue and black refer to the different studies, so those are the measured data. And then the solid black line is the median of our model predictions, and then we include a 95% confidence interval based on our uncertainty around different parameters. Um, and so you can see that um, actually the model does fairly well. It's within a, a factor of two for most of the predictions. Um, and so because it, it, it is well parameterized, we had a lot of data we can reproduce this in vivo behavior for, for, for both different exposure routes. So here we have oral dose, here we have IV, and also for different magnitudes. And what's great about this is that none of these parameters were fit to data. So this is different from a typical PBTK model or PBPK model where you have to do an in vivo experiment and then you use the data from that experiment to fit the model, and then you use the model with a different in vivo experiment to see if it works well, if it's translatable. Um, and here, we don't need to have the in vivo data first. We just use in vivo data to validate our predictions. And this is the model performance for tissue distribution. So uh, again, we're looking at different times. So 28 days, high-dose high oral, 12 days, um, high-dose oral and IV, and two hours after a low-dose IV. And you can see, in all cases, uh, the, the model predictions, though somewhat uncertain, are within um, largely within the 95% confidence interval, um, agree with the measured data. So the take home from this exercise was that we could achieve good model data agreement, but this requires really good knowledge of how PFO enter, PFOA enters the cells and what mechanisms influence the length of, of its stay there. And the big drawback of this is that this knowledge is unavailable for the vast majority of PFAS. So you can do this for a couple of chemicals, but it's gonna take a huge um, burden of data gathering in order to be able to do this same exact exercise for many, many more PFAS. And this is a problem because recent estimates tell us that there are something on the order of 5,000 different PFAS that have been registered or maybe in commerce. And there's a lot of maybe uh, have been estimated because we actually don't have that information for the vast majority of products. We're, a lot of this is confidential business information and so we don't know uh, what amounts of which PFAS are used in all substances. And so this little di iceberg diagram here on the right just gives you an idea of the different classes of PFAS, most of which we have very little data about. Um, what we do know is that almost all the existing data are for these two up here, the, the perfluorocarboxylates and the perfluorosulfonates, what we're calling the legacy PFAS, uh, although the short chains are still very much in use. And then there is this whole arena of emerging PFAS, and I'll draw your attention specifically to the ethers, uh, which are now receiving widespread attention because there have been uh, 
very large contamination issues, for example, in, in North Carolina, the Cape Fear River, um, that is around these ethers compounds, and several of them are uh, being found in uh, human serum and do seem to be bioaccumulating. So there's a lot of concern around these chemicals because we have very little information about their toxicity. So our next um, area of focus here in the group was to understand how to parameterize models like the one I just showed you for untested PFAS, where most of those data are unavailable. Um, whether we can start using maybe some big, big data mining approaches and how we can move from these descriptive models of where they go to more predictive models of what impacts might they have. So how do we move from kinetics to toxicity? So one of the tools we've been using quite a bit uh, is molecular dynamics. This is a nice tool for in silico screening for um, predicting when there will be strong protein PFAS interactions. And molecular dynamics is a tool that's been used for a long time in drug discovery. And so there are a lot of both commercial and open source software available to do this. Um, and it's just something that just hadn't been exploited too much yet in the environmental field, but I think is really picking up uh, more steam and there are more groups that are doing this, both molecular docking and molecular dynamics. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit of how that works. So in essence, you're conducting experiments in silico where you're taking a three-dimensional structure of a protein and a three-dimensional structure of your uh, ligand or compound of interest. Here we're gonna be talking about PFAS. You dock those two together into a, a, a complex where they would be bound. Uh, using a, a docking program, we use Autodoc Vena. And then you can use molecular dynamics to understand what the thermodynamics are of that interaction and therefore predict the strength of the binding between the two molecules. And so what we're predicting with the molecular dynamics is the free energy of binding, which is a function of the energy of the complex and the energy of the individual um, molecules. What's great about this approach is that it gives you information about what's driving that free energy of binding. Uh, is it electrostatic? Is it polar, nonpolar? Um, and so you can start to understand what features of the PFAS make it more or less likely to bind to a particular protein. Uh, the only drawback of this is that you need a supercomputer to do it. Uh, it takes a while, um, but we have those resources here, which is great. And so one, uh, one thing to note as I show some of the results here is that because this is a free energy of binding, the lower the free energy, the stronger the binding. So what you're gonna see more negative means stronger interactions. So we tested this approach for a group of both legacy and novel compounds. So we had some of these um, perfluorinated um, alkyl acids, both uh, carboxylates and sulfonates, and we also included a few of these newer ether compounds. So F53 and F53B, this is a compound that has been shown to bioaccumulate strongly, uh, and it's being found a lot in China. Uh, Gen X and Adana, um, both emerging, uh, and EEA are all these uh, fluorinated ethers that are of concern here in the US. And this is what the results of this screening look like. So uh, on the uh, x-axis here, we have the measured, the measured delta G. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the predicted del delta G. And as I said, the stronger, the more negative the delta G is, the stronger the binding. And so um, what you can see here is that basically the chain length goes this way. So this is your shorter, that's longer. Um, and what you can see is that is there a strong correlation between the measured and the predicted delta Gs. So you can see here the R values range from 0.77 uh, up to 0.96. Uh, this was done for both human and rat proteins. Uh, but the other thing to note is that the numbers on the x-axis and the numbers on the y-axis don't really match. And so uh, one take-home message from doing the studies is that you can predict one from the other, there's strong correlation, but it's a relative prediction, right? So we can order the substances according to which are going to be more or less uh, strong binding, but without original data, you can't predict the actual magnitude of that very well. And the other nice thing about it is that it gives us diagrams like this, which allow us to find things like hydrophobic and electrostatic interactions between the different amino acid residues in a protein. So here we're looking at amino acid residues in the binding pocket of the liver fatty acid binding protein on the rat. And this is your PFAS here, and this is just looking at the regions where they're interacting. So with this kind of workflow, we can predict the relative binding of both legacy and emerging PFAS and get a little bit of insight into why those interactions occur. And we think that's gonna be a really powerful tool to now use uh, to do further exploration of, of these chemicals. So how can we put some of these predictions to work? Um, we, we, we think of um, molecular dynamics as computationally expensive as it might be. 
as a screening tool and as a way to support hypotheses and observations around similarities and differences across species, targets, and different structures. Uh, you know, thinking about differences between zebrafish and mice and rats and humans um, uh, are all things that we kind of treat here. And thinking about implications for toxicity. So what do these chemicals do? So some of the things that we're currently um, exploring in the group are which proteins have the strongest interactions with specific PFAS. So might that help us find a particular target for toxicity um, or a, a means to treat them? Um, what might be the uh, what might these interactions tell us about PFAS toxicity? And are these interactions going to be consistent across all species? So what's the best model to use if we're worried about human toxicity? What about if we're worried about wildlife toxicity? Which are going to be the sentinel species that are going to be most affected by these chemicals? So in a, uh, one of the ways that we've used to identify new biomolecular targets to identify which proteins to look at with molecular dynamics is by screening against known ligands. So here we have a selection of proteins from a variety of species. We've got plants, nematodes, and humans. Uh, we get all of their three-dimensional structures through the protein data bank. That's where these codes come from. Uh, and if they're a good resolution, that means they'll be good for doing molecular dynamic simulations with. They all have different chain lengths, different complexities. Um, but the reason we picked out this particular set is because they have known ligands that are fatty acids. And uh, if you look at and compare the structure of a PFAS to a fatty acid, you'll see they're very similar. So basically, a, a, a carboxylic perfluorinated acid is simply a, a saturated fatty acid where all the hydrogens have been replaced by fluorine. So these two compounds are far from equivalent, right? This, this carbon-fluorine bond is extremely strong, and the fluorines make this tail much more hydrophobic than this tail. Um, but in fact, this would then be equivalent to a quite longer fatty acid uh, in terms of its hydrophobicity and some of its interactions. And so we wanted to see if that would bear out in terms of their interactions with different proteins. Uh, and so here is just some results that we did kind of screening with molecular dynamics to find for a few proteins that were of interest, fatty acid binding proteins on the left and peroxisome proliferator activated nuclear receptors, PPARs on the right. Uh, three flavors of that, alpha, gamma, and delta. Uh, and on the left, it's liver and intestinal fatty acid binding proteins. So we used molecular dynamics to predict their interactions. Again, we were looking for the ones that were most negative, that had the strongest interactions possible. And so we identified some things of interest that we then wanted to pursue experimentally. Um, so here you can see that we found for um, the, uh, liver fatty acid binding protein that really the longest PFAS generally found the strongest, which has already been found. We did find this interesting prediction that PFHXA would have particularly strong binding to liver fatty acid binding protein. So that's something we wanted to verify because no one had seen that before. And then for the PPARs, what we found that was really interesting is that for PPAR alpha and PPAR delta, there were two very short chain PFAS that popped up as being predicted to have strong interactions. So PFBA and PFBS. Um, and that had never been reported before experimentally either. And we thought that's worth pursuing because we're generally moving away from the long chains toward the short chains, and it would be probably fairly problematic if it turned out that these have very strong interactions with certain nuclear receptors. So we then, uh, as part of a collaboration with Jennifer Field at Oregon State University and Emerson Christie, a graduate student with her, and with Mandy Michelson at um, the U.S. Army Corps, we started looking into these PFAS protein interactions and comparing our model um, predictions to experimentally derived um, binding affinities. So we did that using equilibrium dialysis. Uh, and I just kind of want to show you how that compares. Uh, so in gray is the um, molecular dynamic simulations that I just showed you earlier. We've now split them up into weak, um, moderate, and strong binding classes. And this is looking at the PPARs uh, in particular, where we had found these uh, strong interactions for some of the short chains. And then in blue are literature uh, KD values that are already available for some compounds. You'll see there's not much available already in the literature. And then in red are our measured KD values through equilibrium dialysis. And I just want to point out that at least for PPAR delta, we did indeed find um, fairly strong binding with PFBA. And so this is definitely something we want to pursue to understand whether these short chain PFAS that are increasingly being used and are not very treatable in drinking water might be having an impact through some of these interactions. Uh, in addition, we're doing some in vivo work with zebrafish to see if we can start to track down how these protein interactions might impact um, toxicological effects. Uh, so 
we started this by looking at uh, gene expression in um, zebrafish ex exposed to PFOS. So this is uh, hot off the press, um, just came out earlier this week, I guess, <laughs> late last week. Um, and so we were interested in looking at uh, a series of um, fatty acid binding proteins and then some uh, genes that are related to neurological function. Um, so we were looking at both male and female zebrafish and understanding over time how uh, um, exposure to PFOS impacts the expression of things like your liver fatty acid binding proteins and your intestinal fatty acid binding proteins and some key uh, genes uh, in the brain. The interesting thing about this is we found very different um, expression between male and female zebrafish and that also this expression varied a lot over time. And so trying to figure out what's the best time window in which to understand these impacts is going to be really interesting going forward. And this is really a first step towards our goal of linking molecular dynamics with toxicokinetics and toxicodynamics. So we use the molecular dynamics to identify which proteins or which genes we want to look at. Uh, and then we use toxicokinetics to kind of figure out where they go and where they hang out and try to link that to observed toxic impacts. And um, this study is going to be linking to a new study that we're doing right now to really start to understand, understand the PFAS impacts on the gut-brain axis through disruption of fatty acid metabolism. We do not have results ready to share yet, but I'm going to say stay tuned. And I've put in our friendly poop emoji here because we're currently working with a few collaborators to understand microbiome impacts of, of PFAS through interruption of short-chain fatty acid metabolism and what the implications might be for neurological health and other types of toxic impact. And related to that, um, one of the things that we've been doing in collaboration with the US EPA, with Carly Lalone at the EPA, and with Wei Peng at the University of Toronto is to understand how these protein interactions, how robust are they? And do they vary across species? And so the EPA has this neat tool called CEPAPAS that allows you to predict whether a particular toxic chemical is predicted to have the same effect across different species. And they do that by aligning the genetic sequences for the known targets of that chemical. And so we wanted to understand whether our molecular dynamics approach would have similar predictions to what they predicted. So just so you understand kind of how that works, uh, here we're looking at uh, different classes of organisms. Uh, and this is liver fatty acid binding protein um, and understanding whether they think that chemicals that affect that in humans, for example, that are susceptible, humans are susceptible to, will there be the same susceptibility in other mammals, in zebrafish, in birds, and crocodiles, et cetera. And they can identify which residues on the protein might be responsible for a change from a positive to a negative susceptibility. Um, and there have been some measured differences for PFAS in particular in liver fatty acid binding protein. Uh, in this study, where they were looking at both PFOA and PFNA, this is Shang et al. in 2016, and they showed that by changing a couple of uh, amino acid residues in LFADP, they were able to go from uh, measurable, appreciable binding to PFOA and PFNA to no binding at all. And so this gives us a clue that we might be able to understand how mutations and how differences across species will change whether PFAS will behave the same in different organisms. And so we did the same analysis with our molecular dynamics. Uh, and here, for example, is looking at single point mutations, similar ones to the ones that CICAPAS, um looked at, and finding that there are significant differences. If you, from the wild type to that mutation, you actually, here we predict that it's stronger binding for this mutation than it is for the wild type. Uh, for PFOA, and then no difference for PFNA. So this also depends on the type of PFAS you're looking at. Um, and then we did uh, the same thing for um, so uh, for the two point mutations that were done in this study, where they went from binding to no binding. And here we found for PFOA uh, and PFNA, for both cases, we see differences from the wild type. So for uh, PFNA, we would find no binding for this uh, point mutation, and for PFOA, we would find no binding for this point mutation. So it seems like with our molecular dynamics, we can predict similar um, observations as, as were made um, experimentally. And so we did this for multiple types of wild type liver fatty acid binding protein across whole sequences for many different species. Um, so we did this for a suite of different PFAS of increasing chain length, both carboxylic acids and sulfonic acids, 
and for a number of different species here, zebrafish, rat, rainbow trout, madaka, humans, fathead minnows, and chickens. And PFHXA was that weird outlier that we said we saw that humans found most strongly compared to anything else, so I'm not too sure about those results. Um, but I wanted to point out that we do get significantly different results for other chemicals. So for example, the Japanese madaka, not nearly as strong binding uh, with PFBA as the other species. Uh, on the other hand, PFHPA, chicken and rainbow trout, much stronger binding. Again, madaka, not very good binding. Uh, in general, the Japanese madaka was to the right of everything else, so I would suggest this may not be the best species for testing for toxicity risk uh, from PFAS. Uh, and in general, the humans tend to have uh, the strongest binding, not for everything, but in, in many cases, so um, maybe not such good news for us in terms of interactions with PFAS. So all of this uh, shows the utility of molecular dynamics and how it can really be used as an interesting screening tool. It is, however, very computationally expensive. So um, there are some major challenges with it. You need very high quality protein structures. So if your protein hasn't been crystallized and you're relying on, on maybe predicting the protein from the sequence, it can be a little bit um, uncertain. You need good computational resources. Uh, here at Pitt, we have uh, a, a computational research center that really helps us uh, with that. Um, and there remains a relative, it remains a relative measure. So you can predict relative to one another, how the different PFAS bind, but this may change from protein to protein, so without data to scale against, it's difficult to make real predictions. So one of the things that we've been looking into recently, and this was just uh, accepted this week, um, Wei Xiao Cheng's latest paper, is to use machine learning methods to try to predict the bioactivity of PFAS. This was a really challenging uh, study for him because there are very few data out there about what we think of as traditional PFAS, and so he needed to find sufficient training data to um, basically train his machine learning models to predict whether a PFAS would have bioactivity for a particular assay or not. And so what he did that was sort of clever is he found these pharmaceutical, generally, data sets. Uh, so this is the PubChem bioassay database, and there's a few other ones that he used. And he mined these databases that basically have different assays, and they uh, give you uh, classification data. So it's either bioactive or not bioactive. We don't predict any kind of strength of, or, or toxic effect here. So it's just yes, no bioactivity. And he mined these data to basically extract all of the chemicals within these data sets that had fluorinated groups in them. And from that, he was able to make two different um, uh, fluorinated chemical data sets. One we call the CF, this is the, the, the bigger one, it has more than 62,000 chemicals in it. Um, and so this one uh, contains any chemical that has at least a CF group. This is not as the way that we traditionally categorize um, PFAS. The second one is how we generally uh, categorize something as being a PFAS. It has at least a C3F6 group in it. And of course, this is much smaller. This was about a thousand um, structures out of these different databases. Uh, and then these are the number of bioactivities that were found for them across these different bioassays. And this is the active rate. So for the C3F6, what we think of as the real um, PFAS data set, there were 1,000 molecules, 26 different bioassays, and 14,335 activities listed um, for those bioassays, of which about 7% were shown to be bioactive. And so what we wanted to do was to take uh, these data sets to train different types of machine learning models um, using the chemical structures in them as these fingerprints. Uh, and then from that, predict the bioactivity of the OECD data set. So for those of you who are not aware of it, if you've heard that there are uh, approximately 4,700 different PFAS, if you've heard that number thrown around, or nearly 5,000 PFAS, that comes from this OECD database that was published in 2018. Um, and so this is our prediction database. This is just a list of PFAS chemicals. It doesn't have any bioactivity, and only a few of them actually had smile strings we could use to figure out what the structure was. So Cheng took this database, used a package to generate smiles code for as many of them as possible, and wound up with what he called the processed OECD set of about 3,500 PFAS with smile strings. So this is our prediction set. And we used the CF data set and the C3F6 data set um, from the different uh, biological databases and bioassay databases to make our machine learning models, which we then used to do this prediction. Uh, and this is just a snapshot of 
the results. And basically, uh, the thing to emphasize here is that these databases are not for human toxicity. They're not for finding environmental contaminants. And so all of these bioassays that they're doing are kind of geared towards something else. So there are some here that uh, deal with cancer cells. Um, there are some protein-protein interactions. There are some enzymes. And uh, the interesting thing about this, though, is how it can tell us about the activity of different classes of PFAS. And so here we've broken down the OECD list into different types of PFAS and shown where they, they appear to have the most activity. And then the, the length of the bars here kind of tells you how much of each kind we have in there. And so you see there's a lot of fluorotelomer compounds, many PFAA precursors, so things that will break down into alkyl acids. Um, and you see that there are almost no fluoropolymers that's because the OECD list only had four fluoropolymers in it that had some sort of smile string. So there wasn't much we could say about them uh, based on the data that was available. So that was kind of a whirlwind tour of the stuff that we're doing around PFAS using a lot of different modeling techniques. And so I wanted to end on this idea about action because I think that's where a lot of people who are concerned about PFAS, that's where they, they're looking to go right now. Um, so for PFAS that have already been released, we know that we are in the midst of a little bit of a contamination crisis. So the thing that we are planning on focusing on in our group is to uh, understand how we can use knowledge about PFAS interactions to drive innovation and treatment and remediation technology. So one of the things we're looking into is understanding how these PFAS interactions can help inform the design of novel sorbents that might be more successful at removing these from the environment than our traditional approaches, especially for the short chain compounds that are so water soluble and really difficult to remove by um, traditional approaches. But the other area that we're interested in is for PFAS that are proposed to be used in products or are already used in product products. Um, it usually shocks people when I show them that first um, slide of all the different areas where PFAS are used. You know, you didn't know it was in your um, face cream or your fennel floss or whatever. Um, so one of the questions we ask is how can we use our knowledge to guide actions to turn off the tap? And uh, not my research group, but me working with um, some collaborators uh, kind of across the world on that question led to a recent paper. This was led by Ian Cousins um, from Stockholm University. And it's about the concept of uh, essential use. So can we define essential uses for PFAS such that non-essential uses are the low hanging fruit that we can easily get rid of um, so that we don't have to spend a lot of our effort dealing with uh, exposures and contamination issues from categories of PFAS use that are not needed for the functioning of society. And so this paper set out basically three categories, non-essential, substitutable, and essential, and set out a roadmap for how we can start to remove some of these problematic chemicals from the marketplace. So the non-essential uses are those that are not essential for um, health and safety and the functioning of society. Um, use of these substances is really driven primarily by market opportunity. So these are things like dental floss, water repellent surface short ski waxes. Substitutables are those where they've been, come to be regarded as essential because they perform a function that we really uh, appreciate, but where there are already alternatives to the substances. And so it, it, it would be quite easy to just substitute them uh, with something provided we know that the substitute is also safe. Uh, so this is most uses of AFFFs. Um, this is a big topic of discussion in the US right now, but there are many countries that have already moved away from AFFF use. Uh, to fluorine-free foams. Certain, certain water-resistant textiles are easy to substitute. And then there are those tricky uses that are considered essential, especially because they protect health or safety, and for which we don't really have a viable alternative yet. Those are things like medical devices and some occupational protective clothing. Um, for example, surgery gowns that, that keep bodily fluids from being transferred across. Uh, but one important caveat here is that this essentiality shouldn't be considered permanent, but there should really drive the pressure for innovation in the market and to bring all everything that's currently in category three into category two. Uh, so here are just some of the categories and, of PFAS use and sort of where we put them as one, two, or three. And really anything here that's category one should be fairly simple for um, producers and consumers to say, okay, no, we don't need those uh, in our products anymore. So we need ongoing research to document where PFAS are used, what structures are used where, in what quantity, and really to identify these non-essential uses that we can then use to turn off the tap and avoid human exposure, at least to those easy categories. 
And then for PFAS that are already present in the environment, we really need to identify the most critical by how, volume or hazard. That's where a lot of my other research focus is, is to identify which are the most hazardous and focus on developing effective treatment strategies for those. Uh, and given what we know about the effects of some of these PFAS, even at very low concentrations and their extreme persistence, it's really important to, to do that turning off of the tap and to avoid further environmental releases as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so I just wanted to leave you guys with a, a, a final, um, some final thoughts about this multi-scale approach to modeling PFAS and what we can do with it. Um, one of the exciting things about this is that it allows us to incorporate different types of data in vitro and in silico, in silico data together to predict in vivo behavior. It lets us screen multiple PFAS and evaluate differences between emergency and legacy substances. An area that I often talk about in, in teaching is regrettable substitutions, right? It's something we've become all too familiar with. And so if we're going to be uh, if replacing PFAS, we need to be able to compare the replacements to the things they're going to be replacing and make sure that they're actually safer and better. Um, providing insight into sex and species differences to identify both vulnerable populations, human populations, wildlife populations, and importantly, to evaluate whether we're choosing the, the correct suitable model organisms for risk assessment. Um, but we still need to tackle some really important data gaps. So models need validation. We need more in vitro data. And I think we need more in vivo data in order to really have confidence in how our, our uh, models are working. Biomonitoring data to understand how this, these um, isolated uh, observations actually look like in the real world with diverse populations. Um, and going from interaction to effect, the toxicological piece is ongoing and really important. Uh, and given the scale of the PFAS problem, we really need an all hands on deck approach. So I hope there's lots of people on the line and they're thinking about how their research could apply to PFAS and what, what they could do to kind of help move this story forward. Um, and with that, I hope I still have some time for questions. And if anybody wants to email me or um, connect with me on Twitter, those are my details, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have right now. Thanks. Wonderful presentation. Um, I uh, Before we start questions, I'll remind our online audience that you can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar questions tab, and I will read those to Carla. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Well, I'll get us started with one. Um, uh, what do you think the reason might be for the differences in PFAS half-lives between the male and female in the same species? Yes, good question. So I kind of burst through a, a bunch of stuff. And I didn't go into a lot of detail about each one. So that's one of the more interesting ones, and that's a little bit how I got into the whole protein interaction space. There are a couple of really great um, articles in the mid-2000s about this, about um, organic anion transporters in the kidneys, renal transporters, that are supposed to reabsorb essential things, uh, uh, from, keep them from being eliminated in the urine. And it turns out that um, PFAS are substrates of a lot of these transporters, and there seems to be a chain link interaction there. And these transporters are hormonally controlled. And so males express these organic anion transporters more highly than females, and they've done these studies in rats and show, shown that to be the case that the reason the half-lives are longer in males is because they reabsorb more of the, the, the PFAS. So it's not like they're hanging on to them, they're, they're actually re reabsorbing them back from the urine. And they did some studies where they basically treated male mice with uh, estrogen, or male rats rather with estrogen, and found that then the half-life would drop and be similar to what they observed in the females. Thank you. Uh, from online, BK asks, you talked about hydrophobicity of PFOA and fatty, acid, fa fatty acids. Mm -hmm. Did you find which PFOA, say PFHXA, will have similar yeah. hydrophobicity in, to a higher chain fatty acid? And yes. she has a second question, so I'll ask yeah. that. <laughs> Okay, um, so yes, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but there was a paper, and I, I once had a table, I'm sure I have it somewhere in the depths of my laptop, um, where I had the comparison, and I think, I'm trying to remember, it's, it's kind of trying to count dog years, it's similar, right? So one CF2 group is as hydrophobic as I think maybe three CH2, so you, you have to do kind of a, um, but 
think there's a paper with a table that has that comparison. And if the person who asked the question will follow up with me with an email, I'll find it and I'll be happy to share it with them. Okay, um, BK also asked, could you use HLB parameters to find equivalent hydrophobic FA to a PFA, PFOA? HLB parameters, I'm not sure what they're referring to. Um, BK, can you send what you mean by that and I'll ask your third question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you expect similar toxicity and binding if you use similar HLB or hydrophobic FA and as a F, F, as a PFA. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I think there are probably some things that will be similar and some things that will be very different. So um, where we might see some similarities is, so for example, one of the known toxic mechanisms of long chain PFAS is that some, sometimes they're called obesogenic. They lead to accumulation of um, serum lipids um, and I think that's because it's as if you had a lot of long chain fatty acids uh, floating around in your blood, which is not very good, right? Um, but I think that there are other impacts that are going to come from the fact that while a fatty acid can be processed, you know, those, those, they're, they're synthesized into other things, um, the carbon fluorine bond is not broken in vivo in general. And so um, I think there are going to be some toxic impacts that are more related to the fact that they are um, uh, not. Um, they can't be processed and they can't be broken down and, and therefore there might be some competitive interactions that are actually preventing the normal fatty acid metabolism due to competing for similar binding sites. So I don't think it's a straight um, comparison. Okay, we came at hydrophilic, lipophilic uh, balance. So I'll read the Oh, second. okay. Yeah, okay. Um, could you, yeah, could you use HLB parameters to find equivalent hydrophobic FA to a PFOA? Yeah, I think so. I think that's how you would basically figure out. Um, I, and I think where that would help you is maybe to understand these protein interactions, right? Because they are a balance of hydrophobic and electrostatic. And so if you had a, if you had a similar balance within a PFAS and, and another molecule that had a similar balance, you might expect that they would bind um, to, you know, with, with similar affinities. The only caveat there is also that, um, from what I understand at least, fatty acids are fairly squishy. Um, so the, that you can take that tail and kind of cram it up. And often when you find them inside of body pockets of proteins, they are kind of looped around. And the... Um, uh, carbon fluorine tail is, is rather stiff. And so we sometimes see when people do binding studies that um, the binding affinity goes up with chain length and after about a C11 for a perfluorinated acid, it tends to drop down again. And that may be because it then can't fit into a binding pocket in the same way that a longer chain fatty acid could. And so it, it gets incomplete um, interactions. So like the head group can't actually be contacting the same electrostatic sites that a fatty acid would. Okay, uh, from W.T. Chen online. Um, thanks for a great seminar, Carla. I was wondering if you could share your comments about the interaction between PFAS and other emerging pollutants in the environment, such as drugs and microplastics. Thanks. Huh, that's an interesting question. I had not really thought about that. So we, we tend to, in my group, think a lot about PFAS mixtures. But PFAS mixtures with other things is really interesting. Um, I have not thought about PFAS interactions with drugs, but there are fluorinated drugs and fluorinated PFAS. I don't know if you're also thinking about non-fluorinated drugs. I would, I would not really know. They are surfactants, so other things that are that are surfactant-like would be interesting to know if PFAS are creating any kind of mixed micelles out there in areas of high concentration. That would be interesting to look at. Um, and then microplastics, I think, are an interesting area because there are a lot of fluoropolymers out there. And I don't know who is looking at fluorinated versus non-fluorinated origin microplastics, but that would be an interesting area to look into. Uh, I have nothing to say about their impacts because I don't know. <laughs> but I find it interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, another one from online. 
I missed your talk in the beginning, but do you have any data about the membrane um, permeability of PFAS? That is an excellent question. We have not started doing that work here yet. The data that we used to parameterize um, the first toxicokinetic model that I showed in the rat actually used uh, in vitro studies on cellular uptake. And there are some interesting studies that were done with cells both with and without transporters being, so, so we were using some of the data on renal transporters and looked at um, cells that do and do not express the transporters and the differences in the uptake rates um, and also at different temperatures. And we used the low temperature and no transporter expressing cells as a proxy for passive diffusion, those rates of uptake. Um, but the interaction with PFAS, of PFAS with phospholipids is also really important, not an area we've focused on uh, yet, but I think there needs to be more work done on understanding that phospholipid passive diffusion interaction um, and, and what the rates are for different PFAS. I think that's still an open area. And um, the same person asks, uh, don't you think that hydrophobic PFAS should just pass the membranes? Yes, to some extent, but that doesn't mean that they are not also actively taken up or effluxed. So both, both things can happen. And there was a very long back and forth discussion about exactly this question for long chain fatty acids. And I think that in this case, it might be a good proxy to consider PFAS similar to long chain fatty acids, that both passive diffusion and active uptake or facilitated transport can occur, but where the facilitated transport occurs, it's much faster and therefore becomes more important. Thanks. Um, while they're thinking of their last question, I will um, just announce that we'll be uh, adding the recording and the slides to our website archive in about two weeks. And um, do you have any thoughts that you want to leave the audience if there aren't any more questions? Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, then I would, you know, if someone thinks of something later, please feel free to reach out. Um, I've got a group of active and interested students here. So if you think about areas where you, you might be interested in collaborating, please reach out. We're always open to that as well. Um, I really mean this on all hands on deck approach thing at the end. And so I think if other people are interested in getting into PFAS, um, there's a lot of reading to do, but it's, it's, it's an important area of research. And so I would encourage people to do that. Okay, great. Um, we'll officially end the webinar, but as Carla said, you can contact her later if you have any questions or interested in collaboration. Thank you, Carla. All right. Thanks so much.